example how this. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Yeah, eight o'clock. You you are prepared for two hours, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not blind. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is the, the interesting part. That, that previously was, was just an in, introduction. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so this is the motivation for this async API in Windows A and the API that takes more than 50 milliseconds. It's a sim asynchronous. There are no synchronous versions of that. Um, but there is a this problem with with um, async. Um, when you try to program with these things, you, you have to deal with so-called inversion of control. And some people even say, you know, oh, inversion of control, that must be a good pattern, right? No, it's not. It's awful. Okay? What it means is that, you know, you call your asynchronous API, and it doesn't return you the value that you want. You have to pass it a function, a handler. And after a while, you know, this handler is called with the value and, and you continue, right? But your handler is in some other part of the code, you know, and it might go through like the complicated, sometimes it goes through the message loop, for instance, on in Windows and, and calls your handler and so that's, that's nice. Now, since Microsoft did that, they had to have support for it in their languages that they control, and that's C-sharp, and, and F-sharp, and, and EB, I don't know about EB much, but... Uh, and um, they did a great job, okay? The C-sharp guys and F-sharp guys did a very good job, and I was uh, amazed that they, they, they spoke at the last, uh, nah, not committee meeting, but the, the, the little one, on concurrence, right. um, but but unfortunately there is no solution in C++, and you know we are planning this next release of C++ in five years from now, whatever, um, and we have to have a solution for async API, right? Because by then Windows 8 will be like the major thing. Um, no, but nothing. And, and the situation is pretty dire because threads are already messed up, as you know. Yeah. What about the futures? The futures, that's the messed up thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to talk about it. I, I had another talk about the futures. But <clears throat> I mean, futures are great, except that they are implemented very bad. <coughs> So the way to look at async API in, in these uh, abstract terms is to think about continuation. So um, async API is a function that takes a handler, right? This handler can, is called a continuation because it continues the work after this function actually manages to calculate the value, it will call your continuation. So it's like, this is this part of the program, and the rest of the program is in this continuation. Okay, so this is a continuation-based program. Um, but, you know, the handler is called from a different thread often, so you have to be aware of this. or always from a different time. So how can we build an abstract picture of this that would be, that would just take this big problem of uh, asynchronous calls and inversion of control and put it in, in nice terms where the inversion of control kind of disappears from your program and you're just writing a linear, a linear code? That would be nice. And then this is practically what happened in c -sharp. Very impressive. So here's, here's a way of abstracting. Um, define something like an async function. An async function does not immediately do 
stuff, it, it, you just call it and it returns back an async object. Okay? And the async object encapsulates this value that normally would be returned by a synchronous function, but since the function is asynchronous, it's not there. So it's like, I owe you thing, right? It gives, gives you this, this box and says, really, there is a value there, hey? You know? Trust me. Okay? And, and at some point, this value will actually appear there. And if you want to retrieve this value, what you do is um, you give it a function that retrieves the value. So now this fun the continuation, right? So this box will call your function, but it's its leisure, right? So you're saying, okay, now I need the value. Here's here's the function. Call this function. Hey, now uh, and the box is taking its time. And then eventually comes your function. So that's the way of retrieve the, the, the value. <coughs> and we would like to have the system so that we could actually uh, compose these things, this async objects, right? You do stuff with them, right? Like or combinator, and combinator, right? What if I want to apply function to what's inside the box, right? And so, <coughs> And, and we want them to be composable, like first open the file, open file, asynchronous call, right? And then I want to read this file, right? but I have to read the file inside the handler. Ah. So here, here's a definition or sketch or uh, it's it's not it, I mean it's C plus plus code but it's not, never used really. Or is it? No, I'm sorry. It's used. Okay. Uh, so async is a, is a struct and, and us better one. Just one one virtual function and just for simplicity I'm putting void here everywhere <coughs> as the return values of my continuation. So I'm saying, okay, because these continuations don't do anything other than call other continuations or do some side effects. Um, and it's called end then. So do something, right? Uh, the, the asynchronously, and then call my function. So I can function h for n. Okay. And each async object implements its own version of uh, and then. Now async is a functor. That's, that's a great news. That's great news, right? I mean, it's a type constructor, right? Because in, inside a, async you can put any type in there. Uh, and you can lift functions. How do you lift functions? So if you have a function a to b, can you lift it to async a to async b? Okay, here's how you do it. Well, you create a new async, async b, and you have to implement and then for it, right? So you implement and then, which is a function, a method, right, that takes a continuation Okay, and then always takes the continuation to retrieve the, the value. Um, and inside this function, and, uh, and then, it calls the first argument, async a, right, has a method and that too. So the, the first async object, uh, well, no, the, the only async object that it has access to. Uh, calls and then, and and then requires a continuation. So here you create a continuation on this on the spot as a lambda. Say this this I'm passing you this function, and this function is a very simple function. Okay, this function just takes a value of type a, right? Because it's a continuation that you pass to an async object that 
height value of type A and applies F to it, the, 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 the argument, right? And when F is applied to it, it produces a value of type B. But you see, I'm passing it as a continuation. I'm not doing this calculation right now because I don't have the value yet. Right? I'm just saying, okay, I know what to do with the value. Here's a function that will call this function, please, when you have the value. So, so A is the, really the argument to this. So then it applies F to it, produces the value of type B, of course, because F takes A and produces B. And what the, at the end, what it does, it calls this continuation K with that value. Continuation K from here. This is a little, right? Um, we don't know how it's called. So, so I really suggest you guys uh, learning a little bit of Haskell will help you deal with, with things like these. So, in, in uh, hand-waving terms, right? give me a function, give me an async. I'll give you a new async that will retrieve the value from the first async and apply the function to it. Okay. Is it an applicative functor? Yes, it is. It is. Well, first let's define this pure thing, okay? Because that's interesting now. Usually pure was, was, was trivial, but here it's not trivial. Um, so, we have like an arbitrary value and we want to encapsulate it in an async object, <coughs> which means we have to implement and then. So and then takes a continuation, right? And we'll just call this continuation immediately with this value. Okay? So whenever somebody gives us a continuation, we just immediately call this continuation. Here's the value that I'm enca encapsulate. So that's pure. The apply similarly. Now if I should go through this. <coughs> right? I mean you, you trust me. Okay. You can you can you can do an async. Um, uh, applicative. Now why do we want applicative? Because applicative gives us this famous and combinator. This is what you do. Okay, so now we understand the AND combinator. And AND combinator, right, it took two async values and wanted to like, wait for both of them and then do something with them. And, and what C Sharp did is like, okay, wait for them until they return values and they put these values in the vector. That's not general enough. An AND combinator should take a function of two arguments. And in particular, this function could be implemented as taking a vector or you know, being a closure that has access to a vector or a global vector, or whatever. And uh, it just uh, applies and apply this function and, and, and it pushes two arguments, right? And apply this function using applicative to two bar. So this is what AND combinator is, really. It's applicative. Now, OR combinator is really a totally different beast from this point of view. It's a, it's a new beast called a monoid. Remember when I talked about uh, this uh, algebra of ANDs and ORs? Okay, so we have, we now understand that AND really that's the applicative part of this functor. But OR is like the addition, right? And addition can be modeled as a monoid. Monoid is just a, something in which you have defined plus 
well, not really plus, concat or something like that. Right? An operation that takes two arguments and produces another argument, another part. Right? So our combinator um, is non-deterministic, the cancellation problem, and it's implemented using a monoid structure. I mean, this, these problems are not, not so easily solved. I mean, they are there, no matter what. Um, so we need this operation that's associative, right? And that's the or combinator. And, and uh, the other thing that monoid needs is zero. So it's sort of like a group but without the inverse element. So you have addition with zero, but no negative numbers. Okay? What's a zero element, okay? Then let's think about it. So zero would be some async that when it's combined using or with another async, the, com the, the combined thing will just be like the original thing, right? <coughs> so in arithmetic, it's just uh, non-negative integers. You can add two positive integers together. Usually, you can add zero, and yeah. you always get back what you have. Yes. Add. And there was a zero. It's like, uh, and there's no negative numbers in this case. No negative numbers. <coughs> no inverses. No. There's no inverse to async. Which is kind of expected, right? But you can combine the asyncs using or. Right? And you can combine an async with a zero and get the same async. So what async will always... Uh, you remember uh, the, an or is a race between two things? So you hunt the other guy to always win. How do you do it? Well, you never call the continuation. Right? So that's a zero. What buffer space the zero start? Um, it, it is needed as a special case, you know, as, as a default for some algorithm or some things, you know? Like a default value for if you don't provide me another guy, you know, I'm just going to put a zero there, right? I'm normally using or combinator for these two, but I don't have the second one in this particular case. Maybe for the end of a recursion or something? Maybe end of recursion, yes? Eric? Yeah, uh, so with addition, uh, zero seems uh, pretty safe, you know, because uh, you could add it to anything, including itself, and still get back zero. Mm -hmm. But with a, a, an async zero that just never returns, if you or two of those guys together by accident, then you find your program. No, you get another. Zero. I mean, if you ever ask for the result of, of that async, then they're both going to <coughs> wait forever. Correctly. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's an oddball. <coughs> <coughs> it only makes sense when you are it with something else. It's non-zero. I mean, if you just keep oring zeros, and, and then you say, okay, I want the value, well, what do you expect? What value can I give you, right? Yeah, that is the same as calling you just one zero. So this zero plus zero is? It's zero, yeah. yeah. I mean, you gave me zeros, I can't return you possibly any value, right? Therefore, I will never return. Yes? I think maybe the way to think of a solution is you want an out of band value marking the something was or wasn't returned, which is what the null pointer or unique pointer is giving you. Mm -hmm. Because it's an out of band being there or not there, outside of the band of this is the result, because this is the result, mm -hmm. may cover all possible cases that that entity could hold. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Possibly. Okay, so this is a monoid, and the or combinator is a monoid. It's, it's understood in terms of a monoid. Now, the hardest part is chaining these things. Okay, we want to be able to asynchronously open a file and say, 
Um, and, and after doing this, please uh, read a buffer from this file. Okay, so these are two async operations, opening a file and reading from a file. The funny thing is that reading from a file requires a file handle. And this one is provided by this async operation. Okay, so you would like to be able to chain them nicely, like abstract the chaining of these things. I mean, of course, normally what you would do is you would say, okay, I have to get this, first I get, have to get this uh, file handle. So I call this, you know, and in the handler, when it finally calls me, I'll just call this other function from the handler. So the handler has to have access to this other, to this other function and so on. So we want to do it cleanly without the inversion of control. So first, let's start with monadic functions. So these functions that return monadic values, in our case, async values, right, are called monadic functions. They just take whatever arguments, like file handle, let's say, right, but they return an async. So we have a bunch of such functions, the, the APIs, right, that um, return async objects, and we want to be able to chain them. But the next function doesn't want to take a, a, an async as an argument, it wants an actual value. <clears throat> so the way to do this is, um, first of all, every monad is also an applicative function. Okay, so, so in, yeah. So this is monadic function. Um, how do we chain? Okay, so so we, when we have an applicative function, we could try this trick. Um, we can lift the second monadic function. So we have first monadic function, and it produces a monadic result, and, and we have the second one that takes a, a plain value. Why not lift? second function so that it takes a monadic value. But then what it will return is monadic monadic square, right? Like if if we are talking about maybe here, you know, maybe string, maybe end, so when we when we lift the, the function, we'll get a function from maybe uh, string to maybe maybe end. <coughs> This. Now, if we can collapse this maybe square, then we are fine. And that's one way of defining a monad, by providing the operator that collapses stacks of um, monads. But the most popular way of, of doing this is actually defining directly a method called, uh, a function called bind. The bind operation, um, it takes a monadic value, and this is, imagine that this is a value that was returned by another monadic function. We are changing monadic functions. But let's forget that it was returned by a monadic function, we don't need that, we just have a monadic value right now, right? We have an async. Right? And then we have a monadic function that takes whatever is in this async and produces another async. And bind takes these two arguments, okay, so it takes monadic value, monadic function, and should return a monadic value again. So it should produce a, a new combined async. And this is actually the definition, uh, no, it's not the definition, That's, this is how it would look like for uh, Point. Hey, Mark, uh, you back up a bit? Yeah. I think the return type is that bind function as well. This one's going to be return point of the right? Right. Which would, oh, this one? Yeah. There. The yes, yes. Correct. Sorry. B. <laughs> um, here 
here's the implementation of life of uh, bind for unique pointers. So it just shows you that it can be done. Okay, I'm not going to go into detail with this because we are really interested in A's, right? <clears throat> However, bind. Okay, so bind is part of this monad thing, and monad um, is a pattern in which you have two things. You have this bind that I described. You also have something called return, and this return is exactly the same as applicative pure. It's a way of lifting it up. <coughs> so you, you, might, you might say, okay, so return takes a value and has a very well-defined way of lifting this value to produce a monadic value, right? A monadic function <coughs> is a more arbitrary thing. It takes a value, right? and it produces a monadic value, but it's not non-trivial. It does something non-trivial with it and produces a non-trivial monadic value. There are monadic axioms. Okay, now I'm going to explain how bind works. So we'll, have, we'll need to uh, um, enhance a little our, our, our language. So the shaded A thing with the A inside, that's a, that's a monadic value, it's, a, it's an async value, sorry. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll stop saying monadic, just async value. An async value is an object that has an, uh, this method and that. So I'm, I'm just suspending an arrow from it, saying that there's an and, and then method. Right? Um, and then takes a continuation, which is a function that takes an A. It's the same A. It defines this A actually, which is like sitting inside this A symbol. Right? And a, um, a monadic function is something that takes an, uh, an arbitrary type of argument, and I mean, takes an argument and produces a glowing shape, right? an async thing. Which means when it's actually satisfied, it will look something like this. Now bind takes two arguments, okay? So it has two holes. One hole is for an um, async value. And the other one is for this monadic function. So it accepts monadic function here and monadic value here. Async, sorry. Async. I just promised not to use monadic. Async here and async returning function. So, and, and bind produces a new async value. So I can say, okay, it also has it hanging there, uh, <coughs> and then. But and then, you know, <coughs> takes a continuation that takes B. Not in this picture. <coughs> but it's the B is the return type of this monadic function. And here's a concrete example. I think it's best to understand it on, on a concrete example. So we have this, this, this problem that I said. We have, um, you have to open a file, read from a file, and then parse the contents of the, of the buffer that you get from read file. Okay? Very simple scenario. <clears throat> so you have a, a monadic function async open which takes a path and returns an async object. And this async object encapsulates a file handle, so I'll call it a file handle. Um, and it has a method and then, obviously, that takes a file handle. That, that takes a continuation that takes a file handle. Right? And, and then always takes a continuation. <coughs> 
So now we want to bind. So, so first we did this, okay? We got this asynchronous object. Now we are plugging this asynchronous object, this first argument to bind, and we are plugging the read monadic function as second argument to bind. Okay? So we are plugging these two walls in bind. And lo and behold, we get a plug thing, which is an async object. Right? And now we see that this async object has the end then method. And what does the end then method take? A continuation that will pick up the buffer that was read. Filled with data. So here's the um, here's this object, right? And then method. And now we are calling and then method with a continuation. And this continuation is called parse. And it takes a buffer. And this is a place where actually the, the, the whole cascade starts executing. Because before then, all these things were just returning immediately. They were producing async objects. Async, async objects are cheap to produce. <clears throat> so we are calling this end then method uh, with parse. And now we are going inside the implementation of our bind. Right? So bind and then is implemented this way. Here it is. So what it does, it takes the first argument, the asynchronous file handle, right, which has an end then method. Okay, so that's the first argument. And plugs the hole in there with a lambda that we create here on the spot. So we create an, a continuation just, just for this case, okay? <clears throat> and I'm not going to go into this lambda at this point, just a moment later, okay? So, but what happens is that when you plug a hole in and then, what happens is that at this point the operating system call is made to read uh, the file, right? It's an asynchronous call. So we'll do stuff in the background, right, right? And when it's done, it calls our lambda, because that's the continuation. So after a while, later, the system calls our lambda. So what's happening inside the lambda? How is this lambda implemented so that things work together? So here's the lambda, now it's provided with a file handle. So we have file handle. But remember, we have this second argument to bind, asynchronous read, which required a file handle. Here, now we have a file handle, so we plug the hole in asynchronous read. Yes? The battery's about to die. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, so quickly, <laughs> we plug this hole with file handle, right? We get an asynchronous object. And the asynchronous object has the and then method, right? Which requires a continuation. What kind of continuation it requires? I mean, it produces a buffer, right? So, we just plug this with parse. Okay, here we have parse, right? That retrieves the buffer. So, when we call and then with parse, then the calculation starts in the operating system. And the operating system calls our parse late with a buffer. <coughs> and once the parse is, is called with the buffer, it grinds the parsing stuff and goes. <coughs> so the client code here looks uh, in C plus plus looks pretty awful. Okay, I, I want to show you how how this code looks in Haskell. In Haskell, there's this syntactic sugar code do to operate on monads. 
right? And it's very important that this thing works in for an arbitrary monad. And it will, it, it just doesn't make sense to provide a solution for just one particular thing, for ASIC. And then completely different solution for uh, continuations, for uh, futures, right? And then next time, oh, we need a completely different solution for some other problem, like distributed computing, and so on. This problem can be solved by one big abstraction. If you provide support for this abstraction, you can solve a lot of problems. So here's what it looks like in the do notation. You call async open file with path, and it kind of returns your file handle. Okay? In reality, it binds it to a lambda that takes the file handle and does the rest. Okay, so this whole thing kind of becomes a continuation for this guy. Okay, and this continuation calls async read file with a file handle, right? File handle, plug, mm -hmm. and it kind of returns a buffer, right? But what really happens here is that uh, you pass a continuation here that takes a, that expects uh, to be called with a buffer. And finally, return this pure thingy. It just takes this buffer and returns it to you, encapsulated in async. So this code operates very, very quickly. Returns uh, an async buffer. And now the calculation starts in main. Let's say, right? You call this function read file and provide a path. And you say, okay, so this will return me this async object. I'm going to call and then on this object and pass it parse file. And this is where calculation starts. Okay? And this is also a possible trick. You can take any function of two arguments, put it between inverted commas, and it becomes an in infix. And it's sort of like an operator. And that's a nice thing. So say, you know, read file full bin and then parse file. Okay? It hides the inversion of control totally, right? I mean, this is like linear code. This is the code you would write if, if these calls were synchronous. So just to make sure I understand, in that, in that read file, that's, that's sort of like three functions combined together with syntactic sugar and then bound with all these higher order functions, right? Yeah. Okay. Just, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. making sure I have the right idea here. Yeah. In, in fact, I mean, I, I, I wrote it in this way just to, for pedagogical, pedagogical purposes, but essentially you could return it directly here and say return async read file of edge. It's, it's even terser than that. So here's the summary, finally. Um, so we learned about async this hypothetical beast that actually I implemented this stuff in C++. Really. Uh, it's a functor, so it has the apply. Uh, apply uh, you can apply a function to, to a value that doesn't exist yet. Um, it's an applicative, and that lets you create the AND uh, combinator. It's a monoid with this OR combinator, and it's a monad, so you can chain async functions one after another. And then using these, these, these things, you can just, uh, you know, mix and match things. You can build, uh, you know, write programs in terms of these combinators. And what happens is that when these programs run, uh, they run very quickly because they don't have to do any, any work, right? They just return you the final async. And this async is just a program of how to, how to do this stuff, right? And then you call and then on this final async, right? And the whole calculation starts. And eventually, whatever you pass to and then will be called with the final result. So I think it's, 
I probably nobody will listen to it, but I think uh, the best solution for C++ would be to actually implement some kind of powerful general purpose support for these patterns, and especially the, the do uh, combinator, uh, the, the do blocks. Um, this is what C Sharp did in some you know, hidden way, not to expose this terrible <laughs> donut stuff to people, to, not to scare them, but you are not scared, right? I mean, you are scared. Are you saying the C sharp async uh, construct is adequate for this? To make this stuff work? Uh, there, there is more uh, in, in um, C sharp. I don't know. There is an async. There is a wait. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's part of it. Yeah. But are you saying that these constructs are inadequate for implementing these designs and patterns? They are pretty good. Yeah. I mean, they are hiding these patterns. It's, it's not like these patterns are exposed. f -sharp, on the other hand, exposes some of this stuff. They don't call it monads. They, they call it like calculational objects. Or, I don't know. This is a computational workflows. Is that it? Computational. Computational workflows. Work I think that's okay. it. Computational sure. workflows. Mm -hmm. And, and I haven't talked about concurrency, but, but the future is the com combination 